tonight on a day of global action, Montreal takes the lead. We're here with the generations, the slogans, and the security takedown. You just start getting nauseous just thinking about it. A family's reaction to new video. Police interview the man accused of the Toronto van attack. In Washington, the talk is impeachment. But what are they saying in Trump country? And Canada's open secret. I know I've got all scot free, basically. ISIS fighters back home and living free. Bob McEwen has a fifth estate exclusive. This is The National. And this is Montreal, a city where today hundreds of thousands of people marched in the streets for climate action. Where we are right now in downtown Montreal is where that rally ended up. A half a million strong, say organizers, a city that played a big part of a global climate strike demanding action to protect the planet. The crowd was huge and riled up. Their signs and chants declared their mission. This is our future, so we have to fight for it. And among them, Greta Thunberg, the Swedish teen who started these Friday strikes. The politicians marched too, but the vast majority were just regular people who are really concerned, and not just here in Montreal. Climate is not a lie! In St. John's, Toronto and Regina, Edmonton, Moncton, Ottawa, and so many more places, a countrywide cry to just do something. I am scared for my future. That is what all of these students know right now, and that is why we are striking. No more coal, no more oil. Keep your carbon in the soil. For some, these scenes were actually emotional. I feel it, and I know we can make an impact. And around the world today, that same hope, that same sense of urgency. So here in Montreal, the march pulled in people from all over. It was so big, it shut down a section of the city. And as Alison Northcott shows us, it ended with a speech that really was a rallying cry. As these protesters shouted, save the planet, they were joined by so many others with the same message. This says our planet, our planet matters more than corporate profits. And mine says make our planet green again. If we don't uh, start acting, then we could have a serious problem on our hands. Leading them all was Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg and a group of indigenous youth. If we do not take care of the land, she will not take care of us. Concrete actions must be taken immediately. Without the land, we would have no culture, no language, um, no way of being. It's the first time that uh, we've seen so many people from all generations coming together uh, for the climate crisis. Some schools canceled classes for the day and many of those marching were students. Something needs to change and the more this is going on, the more the solution is going to have to be radical. This might make us get taken seriously again by the people who do count up there. Please, for the love of God, Chase, just like something, anything, do anything. As she addressed the massive crowd, Thunberg said actions like this will continue until leaders listen and act. If the people in power won't take their responsibility, then we will. It should not be up to us, but somebody needs to do it. You have addressed the most important issue of our century. Montreal's mayor, Valérie Plante, gave Thunberg the key to the city, and the teen's presence was felt by those who marched behind her. I'm so happy I'm in this moment with her that I feel like I'm in a historical moment right now. For some, today was a culmination of months of action and weekly protests. They say their pressure won't end here. So, Alison, I referenced the mayor there. We spoke with her uh, yesterday, and aside from saying to people she wanted them to remember this enthusiasm when it comes time for action, she also said she was a bit worried about the protests being disrupted. D did that happen at all? 
for the most part, you know, despite the, the scale of this event, Montreal police say that things went really smoothly. They were really uh, satisfied with how uh, it went. They said there were no major incidents uh, on their part and that uh, they called this a historic mobilization is, is how they uh, phrased it. And uh, they said that they were thankful to the protesters, the, the people who participated, uh, for making it a peaceful event. They say it was a logistical challenge, as it was for the city and for public transit authorities as well. Uh, but that all in all, things did go very smoothly. Okay, some good news. Alison, thanks very much. You're welcome. With an election campaign in progress, those huge crowds were irresistible to some party leaders, especially those of the platform that seems to line up with a message of the day. As Katie Simpson tells us, the liberal leader left the crowd a bit divided. Justin Trudeau's climate plan lacks specifics, and he spent billions on a pipeline. So marching in this kind of event comes with political risk. The Liberal leader and his entourage easily drowned out anti-pipeline chants hurled his way. Though at one point, the RCMP had to step in. Removing a protester armed with eggs who got too close to Trudeau and his oldest son. Both were fine. It was one of several difficult moments for the Liberal leader. And he's, of course, obviously not doing enough. In a private meeting on the sidelines of the march, teenage activist Greta Thunberg urged Trudeau to make science-based climate decisions. And while he agreed more needs to be done, he says his plan is at least better than that of Conservative leader Andrew Scheer. But it's no surprise he's not showing up for the climate march because he's not showing up for the fight against climate change. Scheer was the only main party leader not participating in a climate demonstration. The NDP's Jugmeet Singh marched in British Columbia. Green Party leader Elizabeth May and the bloc's Yves-Francois Blanchet also took part in the main Montreal event. I find it interesting and ironic that Justin Trudeau is actually protesting his own government's record on the environment. An unapologetic Scheer used his campaign day to instead announce that a conservative government would prioritize infrastructure projects that reduce commuting times, including wider roads. Less time in their cars, meaning lower emissions as well. A message he insists is not tone deaf, even though these mass protests are aimed in part at pollution created by cars. The environment is one of the issues where the Liberals and Conservatives are furthest apart. Both party leaders think they have the winning approach, so expect them to dig in until the very end. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Just a reminder, next week the National is hosting a special television event face-to-face -face with four of the federal leaders, Justin Trudeau, Andrew Scheer, Elizabeth May and Jagmeet Singh. They will all sit down with undecided voters who have real concerns and real questions. Rosie will be there too to make sure they get the answers they need. Watch for it starting Monday night on The National. Let's turn now to a development and a story that grips Canadians this summer. One of the largest manhunts in Canadian history after three murders by Briar Schmigelski and Cam McLeod. Tanya Fletcher takes us through some new information from the RCMP. There was no indication that these were, were planned or predicted. These were the guns the teens used. The newer rifle legally purchased at a sporting goods store in Nanaimo the day they left their hometown of Port Alberni. The matching shell casings are the primary evidence now linking all of the crime scenes. First used near Liard Hot Springs during an encounter with American tourist China Dees and her Australian boyfriend Lucas Fowler. There's no real clear understanding of why they were ultimately um, chosen. After that, the teens continued on to Whitehorse. The two returned to BC days later and came across Mr. Leonard Dick outside of Dee's Lake and shot and killed him. The suspects then burned their vehicle to cover up evidence and delay police before stealing Mr. Dick's vehicle. They drove that stolen vehicle to Manitoba and used Dick's digital camera to record six chilling videos. In the first video, they take responsibility for all of the killings. They also talk about plans to march to Hudson's Bay, hijack a boat, and then travel to either Europe or Africa. In another, they talk about how they want to turn around and kill more people, how they expect to be dead themselves within a week. And in that final video, they talk about how cornered they feel and explain a suicide pact and their wishes to be cremated. They were cold. They were remorseless. Um, matter of fact.
It is believed that McLeod shot Schmigelski before shooting himself. RCMP are not publicly releasing the videos over fears of copycats. The families have been shown portions, but little solace with the biggest question of all left unanswered. Why? Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Surrey, BC. We are also learning some new details about one of Canada's worst ever mass killings following an unusual court-ordered release. It's a video recording of Alec Manassian talking to police just hours after a horrific van rampage in Toronto last year. Out of respect for the victims and their families, CBC News is choosing to air only a few segments of the four-hour-long interview. Senior investigative correspondent Diana Swain has those details. Better be okay. <laughs> Family photos are still tough for Nick D'Amico, who lost his sister Anne Marie in the attack. Oh, yeah. No, this is my favorite one, though. She was so zany. <laughs> this week, for the first time, he saw the video of the man who killed her telling police why he did it. I think all the emotions, whether it was anger or whatever, sorrow or whatever, all came in together at once and you just start getting nauseous just thinking about it. And you can just have a seat in the corner right over there, okay? Hold on. The interview with a police here, detective please. takes place mere hours after Alec Manassian used a rental van to kill 10 people and hurt more than a dozen others. Well, I am a little shaken to be honest. It's not, like, it's not my usual day, obviously. But that's about as expressive as he gets, even when he's asked if he understands what first degree murder means completely intentional and considered to be what's known as in cold blood. His anger at being rejected by women is what he claims led him to indiscriminate revenge. I was driving down Young because I knew it would be a busy area mm -hmm. and then as soon as I saw there were uh, pedestrians mm -hmm. I just decided to uh, go for it. To be honest the only reason I stopped my attack was because someone's drink got splashed on my uh, windshield and I was worried that I would uh, crash the van. Come on, get down! Come on, get down! He'd hoped to be killed by police, he says, but the officer didn't fall for Manassian's pantomime of pretending his wallet was a gun. Manassian claims he was motivated by similar violent incidents committed by so-called incels, men who believe women have denied them sex. D'Amico is worried the video of Manassian could do the same just makes me feel a little queasy that uh, all of a sudden now there's more of it out there. The video hasn't only been made public. In a rare move, the judge in the case has decided to release it before the trial. She said because he's not being tried with a jury, there was really no reason to hold it back. And she was concerned about any impression the case was being handled secretly, given the magnitude of what happened in this city on the day of the attack. The real issue for the court, she said, will be Manassian's mental state that day. Diana Swain, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, to the ongoing drama in Washington now, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has been served with subpoenas ordered to produce documents about America's relationship with Ukraine. As Stephen D'Souza tells us, it is the latest move in the Donald Trump impeachment inquiry. Joe Biden promised Ukraine a billion dollars if they fired the prosecutor investigating his son's company. When pressured, Donald Trump goes on the attack. His campaign will blanket TV and the web with this ad next week. Never mind that those claims about Biden are very misleading. After a historic week in which an impeachment inquiry began, Trump seems determined to cast the spotlight elsewhere. They lost the election. Now they want to steal this one. Don't let them. Today, three different committees subpoenaed documents from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Five State Department officials were called for depositions. At issue, did Trump pressure Ukraine into investigating Biden just days after freezing millions in military aid to that country? We're going to hold hearings as soon as we can. Uh, we expect uh, subpoenas to go out, uh, more subpoenas to go out um, first thing next week as well. So we're moving with all speed. One potentially damning detail in the whistleblower complaint was confirmed today that records of Trump's call were taken out of normal channels and transferred to a highly classified system. The White House says it was appropriate. The whistleblower called it a cover-up. Use taxpayer dollars to shake down the leader of another country for his own political gain. 
Tonight, reports suggest the White House has limited access to other calls between Trump and foreign leaders, specifically Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. As impeachment talks pick up momentum, Kim Brunhuber went to a Republican stronghold in California to find out what voters there think. Corona, California. It was once known as the lemon capital of the world. It's no longer an agricultural community, but it's still a conservative one. The city's only 80 kilometers inland from Los Angeles, but this is Trump country. All they're doing is attacking, attacking Trump. It's and Jesse Suave isn't subtle about his support. Impeachment inquiry, what do you make of that? It's a joke. Uh, everyone knows. How dumb do they think we are? Trying to impeach Trump is just the liberals trying to undo the election again, he says. And even if they unearth damning details about Trump, the loyalty of these two supporters won't be shaken. Is there any proof that they could provide that would convince you that this actually happened? There, nope, absolutely not. To me, just, uh, you know, your average Joe sitting on my front porch, I think 99% uh, of the U.S. government is out to get Trump. Impeachment will just galvanize Republicans, he says. The Democrats have fallen into Trump's trap. I think Trump's 10 steps ahead of them. Impeachment matters, he says, because several of the neighboring electoral districts in Southern California were, until quite recently, held by Republicans. The impeachment circus could tip the balance and alienate moderates like Craig Inman. I think if the Democrats push too hard, there's a lot of people like me. Inman is talking politics with his daughter, a history major. He's a Republican, but in these hyper-polarized days, he's a rare breed, a swing voter. I don't know who I'm voting for in 2020. The impeachment inquiry could affect his vote, he says, but the Democrats could be making a dangerous gamble when the Republicans lost in the 1990s by impeaching Bill Clinton. There's a lot of people that are starting to say, enough, just enough. We always tell you guys, learn from history, that's why you take history class, yet we seem to kind of be repeating ourselves. Unlike his daughter, he says, it's possible the Democrats aren't studying history quite closely enough. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Corona, California. More news ahead on the national, including special coverage from Montreal. What is it like for one generation to watch another take the reins like never before? We look at a passing of the torch. But first, a fifth estate investigation. You will hear from a man who says he killed for ISIS and he's now living free here in Canada. And a new development for a Canadian landmark. The proposed addition to the Chateau Laurier is, as you may have heard, controversial. We'll see you in two minutes. You are about to hear from a self-confessed ISIS member and killer living free in Canada. He left this country to join the extremist group and now he is back living amongst Canadians and there are many more like him. Here's Bob McEwen with an exclusive investigation from our colleagues at the Fifth Estate. Since the defeat of the Islamic State, U.S. supported detention camps in northern Syria have overflowed. Thousands of foreign fighters and their families rounded up, then locked up. I'll have no choice but to release them into the countries from which they came. Donald Trump's threat puts pressure on Canada because about 100 Canadian recruits joined ISIS, dozens now imprisoned and hoping to be rescued. I'm from Canada, and can you help me get home? I'm probably more dangerous than the guys that are coming back after all these years. And this man is already back home. We approached him near Toronto with a hidden camera. He has admitted killing for ISIS, but he's never been tried or even charged. So we're concealing his identity and using his ISIS name, Abu Husayfa. Should people be afraid of you? Uh, Why do you like no. I you're asking to because ask you. I'm living, again, like I said before, I'm living amongst them. They don't know who I actually am. What they should be afraid of is harming our people or restricting us because that'll cause us to like spread our ideology and it'll keep us even more steadfast. Yeah, on the way we are thinking. Abu Husayfa says he got off scot-free, even after describing his ISIS experiences to the New York Times. Take me to the first execution. The guy in a distance in front of us would give us a cue. We killed them. These individuals travel to join a terrorist organization. That is a criminal offense in Canada. He's out there free and clear at the moment. Why? 
<laughs> yeah, that's probably the million dollar question. He admitted to participating in two executions. He's come back to Canada. The RCMP surely knows about it, but to our knowledge, they have made no charges at all. Where there is credible evidence, they lay the charges and they prosecute. But for Abu Hussefa, that hasn't happened. So far, an estimated 60 foreign fighters have returned to Canada, and just four have been tried. Consider that policy a work in progress. Bob McEwen, CBC News, Toronto. So make sure you watch Bob's entire investigation, including an exclusive interview with another ISIS fighter from Canada who is being held in jail in Syria. That is Sunday on the 5th Estate. So let's go now to our newsroom in Vancouver, where Ian is following several other stories tonight. And Adrian, we begin in Quebec and Canada's first confirmed case of vaping-related illness. Few details have been released, but federal officials say a patient in his 50s was admitted to a Montreal hospital suffering from severe pulmonary disease after using an e-cigarette to help quit smoking. If the evidence that we have in the next days or months makes us think that the threat is very important, we could ban it. Now, last week, we did learn an Ontario teenager was put on life support after using a vaping device. Whether he'll, his illness was due to vaping has not been confirmed. And moving on to other stories now, in addition to Ottawa's historic Chateau Laurier, has been dealt yet another blow. A city committee has rejected a significant part of the design, a controversial, boxy addition to the 100-year-old building. It said the project didn't respect the historic properties around it and wasn't good planning. And in Prince Edward Island, the transportation minister is saying it's going to be a long wait for homeowners whose properties were ravaged by Dorian. The no barriers way was the clearest way to get into it because I didn't want to leave anybody behind. The province has promised help to anyone who asks for it, regardless of income, but the line is hundreds of properties long. Extra crews are working overtime hours to try to meet the demand. A popular home delivery service, DoorDash, has had its data hacked. We'll have the details in 20 minutes. All right, time for a quick break. When we come back, three young Canadians share three stories of inspiration, why they chose to march today. Plus... She's a hero. She's an autistic hero. You'll meet a mom and son, both with autism, both inspired by Greta Thunberg. Welcome back to Montreal, where earlier today, hundreds of thousands of people marched in the streets demanding action on climate change. Leading this global youth movement and this march, Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old from Sweden who is inspiring her generation to act. Seen here this morning with an older Canadian climate activist, you know him, David Suzuki. Today, this kind of meeting of the generations happened over and over again. They formed a front. Where is she? Indigenous youth who've been drawing attention to the climate crisis for years, taking the lead, creating a bit of a shield for the tiny figure with the outsized impact. Greta Thunberg's determination to call out older generations for their empty words and destructive ways didn't push those older generations away. Instead, it drew clusters in their 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond with a we're sorry message. And sometimes a hearty, we really did try. David Lang certainly did. In 1973, I built an electric car. I took an Austin Mini, converted it to electric motor using an aircraft starter motor from a DC-3. Electric cars are the future. We have to get off fossil fuels and nothing gets done. Uh, this can't what, go on forever. What makes you think this is different though? Or do you? Well, I think things are coming to a head now. People are realizing that um, it's really important. <laughs> All day in Montreal, on the fringes of a swell of youth, seniors slid into the crowds. Some talked of wishing they had the sort of support decades ago when people mocked them for their environmental consciousness. Run it, run it, run it. Some acknowledging they were too late to the realization. We weren't mindful of our, our climate. We weren't aware. We didn't follow our parents' initiatives. 
brown paper bags for our groceries, um, going for cars, spreading out our cities so that it's harder to get around, not having the public transportation that we need, eating too much meat. Let me ask you a question, if I may. What do you see about this intergenerational conversation here? Like, what do you want to say to Tracy here? I'm happy that we can come together on something and recognize that this is a, a, like, a problem that needs to be addressed. What's your name? Anais. At times, there was an odd confessional feel to some of the conversations. We didn't uh, pay too much attention to environment. We were busy in doing all the kind of things which makes our life easy. So Iqbal was just telling me that, well, that you feel guilty, right? I, fa I feel guilty because it happened, all these things happened during, uh, under our watch. And well, I mean, I feel that it's something that's been, it's been, ever since like the re Industrial Revolution, that's been the mentality that whatever you can produce, you can produce it as much as you want, so why, why make it last, especially if we live in an economy that the point is to buy, buy, buy all the time. So I mean, if you feel guilty, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. And, and I, I think it's good that people recognize uh, responsibility. Discussions, not arguments, mind you, not in this crowd, about what tangible changes all these people will make when they go home this night. Some suggesting maybe they'll stop eating meat, maybe they'll rethink their investments, maybe. And yeah, we're the hardest hit, the people in the north. I know. Yep. I cry for you people. I'm very, oof, I'm touched every day. What have people said to you today? Have people come up to you and talked to you? Some people came up to me to take pictures saying thanks for joining, but really we've always been there. We've always been fighting. And it's just really nice to see other people out here to come fighting for us. You said it actually makes you emotional. Yeah. It makes me want to cry to see all these people coming out today. This is about our these two Indigenous about teens our say they were suspended from school for going on a climate strike too. last week. Hostile. This day doesn't feel so lonely, no matter the generation. So all ages are marching, but at the very core of this call for action are young people, of course. We spoke with others who helped organize the marches in Toronto, Vancouver, and right here in Montreal. My name is Alina Rougeau. I'm 20 years old and I'm studying in Toronto. I am here today because we've been striking for a year as young people and we haven't been heard. I'm Rebecca Hamilton. I'm 17 years old and an organizer of this climate strike in Vancouver. We're here because we are in the middle of a climate crisis. My name is Emma Lim, I'm 18, and I was participating in the strike today because we have less than eight years to prevent temperatures from rising 1.5 degrees. I'm really hoping that people feel empowered by this and feel like after this, they can go organize in their communities. We're hoping that this is gonna elevate the awareness of um, climate justice. I hope this protest will inspire action while we still have time to act. I became involved in climate activism around the age of 10, actually. And I realized, okay, I want to focus on climate justice in my activism, in my everyday life, really. And then seeing people striking in Europe meant it was obvious for me that I had to just keep going here. You guys were so far behind, I would say, here. So climate striking was for a way, was a way for us and for me to say that no, we are standing on the side of science. We are breaking this dissonance and it's the world that needs to follow um, this direction. I started striking in front of my city hall the moment um, I realized that a single person could have an impact. And I, I was alone at first and for a long time. So that's why it's so inspiring um, for me to see all of these people here today. Greta Thunberg definitely um, enabled me to find kind of the way to address the systematic problems. I have been inspired by Greta Thunberg, um, and I think that there's also so many other amazing young organizers all around the world. I think Greta was the catalyst for, for the climate action, you know. She's, she's only been doing this for a year, and so what her impact was, was that she showed people that even a, a little bit could make a big difference. Her idea of striking, it just occurred to me, I was like, that is, that's it, that's the way we do it. I want our government to start taking this seriously. During World War II, the war is the lens through which every government decision was made, and we need climate to become the same lens. I want Canada's elected officials to develop a comprehensive plan to stay below 1.5 degrees of global warming. So I really want them to see this 
Beyond the partisan lines as a human thing, and you know, if you're gonna take off your politician mask for a second and think in terms of a person, do I wanna be responsible? Do I wanna be on the side of history that resisted the change we need to be saved? I hope you don't, because you shouldn't be in government otherwise, yeah. So you've just seen the inspiring, binding, bringing together power of Greta Thunberg. But for all the young voices like hers that step up and say something, what do they really end up doing? One child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. Remember, Malala Yousafzai is from Pakistan's Swat Valley, where the Taliban tried to kill her for speaking out for girls' education in 2012. Now it's time to speak up. Her activism only accelerated after the attack. Through the Malala Fund and her Nobel Peace Prize money, this school for girls got built. 180 girls now attend. Would they have had that chance without Malala? The fundraising has also helped girls in Kenya, Lebanon, and Turkey. And Malala continues to speak on a global stage. They say that no laws could have been able to prevent the hundreds of senseless tragedies that have occurred. We call BS! After 17 people, mostly children, were gunned down at a Florida high school in 2018, the youngest voices were the loudest. And soon, they organized with a message, never again. That was the rallying cry for hundreds of thousands of people around the world to march. To the leaders, skeptics, and cynics, welcome to the revolution. But how real was the revolution? In the state of Florida, the Parkland pressure helped raise the minimum age to buy a rifle and banned bump stocks. That's a deadly accessory that makes rapid firing easier. Major retailers tightened their rules. One even got out of the assault style rifle business completely. Small measures, and certainly the mass shootings have not stopped, but perhaps a lasting legacy of these young people was the ability to organize and sustain. Not far from where I live, there are communities that have lived through boil water advisories. I ask myself, why is it this way and why in my province? Why in my country? And before the summer of Greta, there was autumn. Autumn Peltier, an Anishinaabe teenager who's taken every chance to push for clean drinking water in Indigenous communities. I just said to him, I'm very unhappy with the choices you made and broken promises to my people. That moment with the Prime Minister and many others has earned her the title of Chief Water Commissioner for the Anishinaabe Nation. Measuring the impact of her advocacy isn't always easy. There are still 56 long-term drinking water advisories in Canada. So Peltier is far from done, and tomorrow she'll speak again at the United Nations. And then, of course, there's Greta. She has mobilized a generation to fight climate change, but she's also an inspiration to others who have something in common with the teenager. I've never heard of anyone being autistic who's famous. Greta has called her autism her superpower, but you'll hear what that means for others like her next. We'll see you in two minutes. She is just 16, of course, but Greta Thunberg is the face and voice of a new global movement, a galvanizing force of righteous fury, chastising political leaders over climate change. Thunberg attributes her passion to her unique neurological makeup. She is a person with autism, and by embracing it as a gift, she's now helping to inspire others. Joanna Miliotis shows how. To all those here, and to them especially, Greta Thunberg is a force of difference, empowered by her own. Anne Bolding King and her son Baxter have autism too. She's doing something that's very, very hard, speaking in front of all these people and doing all the things that she's doing, and it's incredibly important. The 16-year-old environmental activist calls her autism her superpower, the fuel behind her stark, searing tirade against climate change. She's a girl creating a storm, not in spite of her disability, but she says because of it. I have Asperger's. I'm on the autism spectrum. In some circumstances, it can definitely be an advantage, and especially in such a big crisis like this when we need to think outside the box. We need to think outside our current system, that we need people who think 
outside the box and who aren't like everyone else. And there's nothing typical about Greta. Staging school protests, setting off across the Atlantic in a zero carbon yacht, berating world leaders without blinking. You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. How dare you? Her message is singular, blistering. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. And like most people on the autism spectrum, her honesty is glaring. She's a hero. She's the hero for climate change. I mean, these issues have been around for decades, but people have not been listening. There's something about the way that she delivers her message that gets people to listen. And I, I think it's because she's doing it autistically. She's doing it in a very forthright and honest way. We demand a safe future. Greta's unwavering voice rises above the noise, says Anne, because it is so rational, so black and white, so hard to ignore. I think it's great because I, I've never heard of anyone being autistic who's famous. First person who's autistic in my generation who's, who's become famous. That's so, pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Greta has become a sort of neurodiversity rock star. But while her autism is being celebrated, it's also being ridiculed. And a mentally ill Swedish child. Driving her is unstable, is unfair. But she is unstable. She's been dismissed as unhinged, an unwitting pawn. Her rage mocked by the U.S. president, a jibe Greta turned around by adopting Trump's words as her own and posting them on her Twitter bio. Her inability to abide hypocrisy and her willingness to speak the blunt truth. Steve Silverman has written about the history and legacy of autism. He says Greta's lack of guile is a weapon against her haters. Uh, the level at which she's being attacked is really disturbing, but it's also just kind of immature and, and childish, really, the attacks leveled against her. And so she comes off as the only adult in the room when the President of the United States comes off like a petulant child who won't admit that science is true. Welcome to The Daily Show. Thank you so much. What is the biggest thing that has stuck out to you in New York City? Greta is incredibly poised, and that alone is huge. All the impressions, everything is so much, so big, so loud, and... Uh... <laughs> and that's not a joke. People with autism tend to be extremely sensitive to sensory overload, crave routine and quiet, need to know what happens next. For her to give interview after interview, uh, to travel, to be in unfamiliar settings, to have her routines constantly disrupted, because one of the most important things to maintain the sort of serenity, really, of an autistic person's life is for them to maintain a predictable routine and to not be surprised by sort of breaking events. And I really wish her luck and strength. It just feels great, doesn't it? is an awesome person. She really is. We just saw her and a lot of other amazing people speak, and it's just been a really incredible day. Incredible, inspiring, all the more so, they say, because she's making a difference simply by being herself. Ioana Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Ian is back in two minutes with more news here on The National. And still ahead, a controversial opera classic gets an update. We will be right back. Welcome back to the National Newsroom in Vancouver. U.S. investigators say they still don't know what sparked that deadly blaze that killed 34 people aboard a California dive boat. Officials say they have concluded the examination of the charred wreckage but haven't found the cause. Early reports suggested charging electronics on board may have been involved. This led to warnings from officials of charging lithium-ion batteries and extensive use of power strips on vessels. Parts of the boat have now been sent to labs for additional testing. There's been a massive security breach of a popular food delivery app. DoorDash says information of nearly 5 million users could have been stolen. That data included customer names, delivery addresses, and partial banking and credit card details. But it says there wasn't enough information to make fraudulent charges. But here is some important advice. DoorDash says customers should change their passwords. And Prince Harry has followed in his mother's footsteps during his trip to Africa in Angola today. 
to walk in her footsteps is, is clearly quite emotional for me. Um, but I think as much as, she, as much as she did then, there is still so much to do. Harry met patients and doctors at a hospital built on the site of a former minefield. In fact, later in the day, he also met the same victim his mother once did. Video of Diana holding the then 13-year-old girl in 1997 was seen around the world. The country is still cleaning up landmines from its 27-year civil war. We'll be back in two minutes. Up next on The National, the Canadian Opera Company is making big changes to the production of Turandot ahead of opening night. We'll tell you why. For nearly a hundred years, Puccini's opera Turandot told a story of a Chinese princess who kills one suitor after another until a prince wins her heart. But it also has a bit of a more controversial legacy, something the Canadian Opera Company is trying to address. Here's Deanna Sumanak Johnson. When a new production of Turandot moved from Europe to Canada, the Canadian Opera Company felt it needed to be adjusted. So they called in actor Richard Lee as a consultant. I am not there to make changes for the artists. I am there to go, hey, this is something that I see that uh, I have an issue with because I think, uh, I think it can potentially be very hurtful for an audience that comes to watch it. What this meant was doing away with some of the makeup and costumes that call to mind Asian stereotypes and specific changes to three characters. Watching you know, three ministers kind of jumping around and juggling and, or being silly uh, comes off uh, very hurtful, I think, to, uh, to a person like me, an Asian Canadian person, uh, specifically Chinese. So the jester-like characters, Ping, Pang and Pong, got a makeover. New costumes and new names, Jim, Bob and Bill. Racial stereotypes and the tradition of white performers painting their faces run deep in the opera world and affect some of the most popular pieces, like Madama Butterfly or Otello, where until recently white men performed the lead role in blackface. But changing these beloved operas is tricky stuff. The singer who plays one of the three ministers in Turandot doesn't think the changes to his character work. I was, I was kind of jarred by it, to be honest. Um, because for me, I feel like Turandot is a work that needs no apologies in terms of the characters and the names of the characters. He would like to see something and, else happen, like actually hiring more about. diverse singers. For years, the reasoning offered by opera houses was that most of the top talent happened to be white. I'll call BS on that. There are so many, so many talented Asian opera singers. There are so many talented artists of color. Even in this tweaked version of Turandot, the lead roles of the Chinese princess and her father are played by white singers. Is it enough? No, it is absolutely not. But, uh, but it's a step forward, and uh, I recognize that, and that gives me hope. Hope that a centuries-old art form can change its pitch to meet modern audiences while still keeping its grandeur. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up on The National, she was told she could not strike, but today she did it anyway. That's next in our moment. As young people took part in climate strikes across the country, one Calgary student was told she could not, but she did it anyway, and that is our moment. The school board is making a mistake by not letting me do this. I had a strike planned, but just so that we would all go outside for an hour and just do the best we can to make a difference. They decided to ban all big talk about climate action and climate change. We weren't allowed to do strikes, we weren't allowed to do like big thing, big speeches at assemblies. I'm a kid and I really care because it's my future, it's the planet's future. Tomorrow what my plans are is my mom is going to come and sign me out just so that I can do it. I'm hoping for at least a couple more than me, but I'm never too sure. I feel proud that even though there's only a few of us that we're still doing it and that we're still pushing on. What do we want? Climate action. When do we want it? Now. 
Okay, so Liv Barton, who is 10 years old, by the way, uh, apparently she was denied because the Calgary Board of Education said it wasn't a Calgary Board of Education event and, and they weren't promoting it. But she also said that she thinks she might have gotten more out of this than if they'd let her do what she wanted to in the first place because now the school says she can have like an eco club and she can run it. So uh, for a 10-year-old, uh, she, she's figured it out. And you know, Adrian, there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of uh, interesting stories today with students right across the country, outside the door of our uh, newsroom here. Uh, the streets just filled, of course, in Montreal as well, and many places uh, in between. It has been quite a day for a lot of uh, people, but particularly young people. That is the National for September the 27th. Good night. Good night.